Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we're joined again by Dr. Eddie Stenium to give our weekly COVID-19 update for the state of Utah. Eddie, as always, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So let's go over case counts and trends first. I just want to talk about what's been going on in the state. In the state, we have a total of 56,109 cases. Our daily rate or case count yesterday was 370. We have a total of 430 deaths and 3,273 hospitalizations. Let's break that down a little bit. How is Utah doing? Are we seeing a downward trend at all yet? Are we still kind of plateauing? How have we been doing moving into the colder weather? Yeah, so, I mean, we really had a nice decline from our peak in, in July and into early August. And so we've had this really nice slow decline. And now what we are really seeing is kind of a plateauing. Um, you know, we are now just kind of in this zone where we have between 300 and 400 cases a day and it's kind of going up and down. Um, haven't seen a really significant decline since then. You know, so keep in mind that this is still about two times the amount of cases that we were having back in April and May. And so, you know, back in April and May, we were having between, you know, 80 and 150 cases per day. And now we're you know, having anywhere up to 450 cases per day in the last couple of weeks. Yesterday, we had 370 cases. Um, and so we, we are in this stabilization period, you know, definitely could be fewer cases. That's ideally what we wanted, but um, we have a decrease in hospitalizations. That's really kind of steadied and plateaued as well. It's really given us a little you know, time to you know, make sure that we can care for all the patients that are being admitted to our facilities and um, we're not at a period where we're really concerned about max capacity at this point. Um, school has now been back in session. And so, um, and most of the school districts are, whether it be a hybrid model, in-person or total virtual, we're gonna now really see that impact come in here shortly. Um, and I think we're already starting to see it when you dive into the details and the demographics of the people getting infected on the state health department page, what you're seeing is that that age group of 15 to 24 year olds, um, that's the age group has really seen an uptick in cases recently. So in the past, you know, two weeks, the biggest increases we've seen in the is in the 15 to 24 year old um, age group, which is obviously high school and college students. So um, a really big influence on that. And then once they get infected, it's how quickly is their infection going to transmit into the general population or into you know, their families and older people. And so um, time will kind of tell on that, but so far we're steady on our cases um, here uh, across Utah. It is becoming um, more and more clear that it's very regional. And so if you look into the case counts themselves, Salt Lake County, for example, has 90 cases yesterday. Um, Utah County had over 175 cases. And so if you look at it at a county by county level, um, Utah County in the past seven days has certainly had the highest cases per 100,000 people, um, and Salt Lake County is significantly lower than that. So we're, we're definitely seeing regional changes, um, Utah County getting more cases, Salt Lake County getting fewer cases, and an increase in the um, 18 to 24 year olds. And it's interesting too, because Utah County has a mandated mask um, situation down there. So we would hope to see that number start to decline. And I don't know if it's too early. I think it's been about two weeks. So hopefully we start to see that decline and it'll really take people actually listening to that mandate and wearing a mask in public for that to happen. So ho hopefully Utah County sees a slight decline for that. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing um, to have a mask mandate and it's another thing to actually wear a mask. Um, and so what we would expect is if the mask mandate um, went into effect and people were compliant with masking, then we would anticipate starting to see a decline about two weeks after the initiation of the mandate. I haven't seen any data in terms of compliance with masking in Utah County. There had been some earlier before the mask mandate. I haven't seen anything since then reported. Um, but yes, if people are compliant with the masking mandate, we should start seeing cases decline. Um, I worry that, you know, there's a big college, a couple colleges in Utah County and, um, you know, BYU and some of these other colleges, you know, this is a great place to spread the virus. And so, um, you know, we may very well be seeing this increase in the 18 to 24 year olds driven by colleges. Um, and so we'll just have to follow that data on that. 
And I know, I think BYU is one of the schools that's still playing football this season too. So that will be interesting to see what happens. And I think it's important to reiterate the need for that college age group to really make sure they're wearing a mask. I know it's college. You want to go out and have friends, fun with your friends, but the quicker we can kind of figure this out, the better it will be for the future too. So hopefully um, that changes a little bit. We'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Agreed. I want to talk about something that I actually saw on the TV a little while ago. Um, there was uh, an expert on there talking about UV light and the fact that he was wearing this UV light bracelet that apparently kills COVID. So he showed an example of it going over like the surface of his phone or when you're on a plane and cleaning it. Is there any evidence to support that UV light can actually kill the virus or should we just be making sure we take the normal precautions if we're out and about? Yeah, probably the latter on that. I know very little about this new proposed mechanism. I mean, UV light has been shown to be uh, have an antibacterial, um, you know, quality to it, an antiviral quality to it. I've seen no studies that have shown that this is effective in uh, preventing the transmission of, of SARS-CoV-2. Um, is it harmful? Probably not. So, if you want to get a UV light wand and wave it around things and do all of the precautions that. Um, you would otherwise do hand hygiene, cleaning your surroundings, Clorox bleach, all that, go for it. You know, I see no reason why not to. Um, but by no means would I say that you can just use that and forget about the precautions that we are known to have an effect, washing your hands, wearing a mask and social distancing. Um, so yeah, haven't heard much about it. Yeah, I, I feel like as more of these things come out too, it'll take a little while for us to actually have the research that backs whatever the proposed uh, safety precaution is. So take whatever you see with a grain of salt. I did just look up, the FDA does have some information on it, but it doesn't say that it's 100% effective. It says that it can clean things. So just keep that in mind when you're seeing these news stories or anything like that, that um, it, it, we don't have enough research yet to fully back something that's out there on yeah. the market. So. You mentioned school being back in session two, and this question was brought up a lot about the quarantine. And I'll give you an example. If someone uh, has their child get a call from the health department telling them that they were in close proximity to someone who tested positive, um, they're supposed to quarantine for 14 days. This parent wants to know if after seven days from potential exposure, their child has no symptoms and they test negative, are they still potentially able to get infected and should they wait out that full 14 days or can they return to school? Yeah, so um, this is you know, a, a really good question and I think we're gonna see some variability from district to district on this. I can tell you that um, the state plan on going back to school that's released by um, Utah Department of Health in the state of Utah says that if somebody has been in close proximity and is a high risk um, for transmission for SARS-CoV-2. So that somebody has spent at least 15 minutes within six feet of an individual, regardless of mask use, um, that person is at high risk for developing SARS-CoV-2 and that they need to quarantine. And quarantine is a 14 day period that you go and you wait for symptom onset. And if you remain completely asymptomatic through those 14 days, then you can come out of quarantine and go back to school. Um, and so that's what that quarantine period is meant for. And the reason we do 14 days is 14 days is the incubation period of the virus. I mean, on average, if people are going to get the virus, they're gonna get it at day five to seven after exposure. That's the average time it takes for somebody to get infected and then develop symptoms. But it could be as long as 14 days. And so that's why the incubation period is 14 days. And so as it stands right now, the Utah policy is if you've been in close contact with somebody, you are quarantined for 14 days. Now, if in that period you go and you get tested, let's say you get exposed to somebody, you're in quarantine and you get tested at day three and negative, that's great, but it doesn't mean that you're not gonna turn positive at day four, day five or day six. Um, and so the example you brought up is getting tested at day seven. And so you go in, you get tested at day seven, you maybe get notified on day eight and I'd say, can I go back to school? You know, there's some data that a negative test at day seven is, is pretty good and that will be predictive of you're not going to develop symptoms. That said, this is really has to go back to the, the school districts and what their policies are on quarantine, okay? Because um, as it states right now in the state kind of um, regulations is that it's a 14-day quarantine and that the testing does not play a role. 
Um, yes, there may be some data about a negative test at day seven, but that really should be dependent at the, at the school level. And I would say, ask your school, ask the district how they're managing quarantines um, and, um, and talk to your providers um, based on those policies. But the statewide um, regulation is a 14 day quarantine without testing in there. And will you just explain to us again what the difference is between quarantine and self-isolate and which mm -hmm. one you're supposed to be using in a circumstance like that? Yeah, that's great. So a quarantine is if you've been exposed to somebody that has SARS-CoV-2, you go into quarantine. And so you essentially are isolating yourself, you're minimizing close contacts, and you're waiting to see if symptoms developed. And so people that are in quarantine are asymptomatic. They don't have the disease that they know of but they're at high risk of potentially developing the disease. And so that's the quarantine period. Self-isolation is if you are infected with SARS-CoV-2. And so if you get infected and you have symptoms, you have sore throat and cough and fever, and you're diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2, now you go into self-isolation. And self-isolation is that you know that you're infected and you wanna prevent the transmission to anybody else and stop that transmission chain. You go into self-isolation to ensure that you're not exposing other people unnecessarily. Um, Self-isolation is 10 days from the date of your symptom onset. And so after 10 days from when your symptoms started, um, as long as your symptoms are better and you're afebrile for over 24 hours without the use of Tylenol or ibuprofen, then you can come out of isolation because you're no longer transmissible, you're no longer infectious. And so self-isolation period, 10 days from the date of symptom onset, as long as your symptoms are improved and you don't have a fever. Um, quarantine. 14 days waiting for symptoms to start. And if they do start and you get tested and you're positive, then you go into self-isolation. So it could be up to 24 days, essentially, if you if yeah. you tested positive on the 14th day, essentially. So that's <clears throat> good to know. And, you know, you really also have to think about, you know, an example came up this week about um, how do you manage a positive family, for example. So an individual um, has a child, uh, who is infected and another uh, the mother also was infected and then the father was caring for the mother and the child and so now the father is being exposed to these people that have um, SARS-CoV-2 that person is at high risk so the infectious period for the mother and child is 10 days from symptom onset okay and then the caretakers quarantine period doesn't start until the end of that infectious disease period and so then quarantine starts for that individual at day 10 and lasts for 14 days. And so that person essentially is out of work for 24 days because it's 10 plus 14. Um, so some of these things can get really complicated in terms of um, caregivers, when you can go back, when you can't go back, how does work you know, account for this in school? So um, it, it can be a, a challenging discussion. And along those same lines too, with the example I gave, it got tested at day seven what is our normal recommendation for when you get tested after exposure and why is there that waiting period? What, what's so important about that? Yeah, so um, the state health department will do contact tracing. And so if somebody turns positive, they'll identify the people that they've been in close contact with and they'll go and test those people to see then where it also was spread. And so doing contact traces really slows the transmission train down um, as this virus spreads. And so, you know, if you get exposed um, and you go get tested immediately after the exposure, that's not enough time for the virus to start replicating in your upper respiratory tract for it to turn positive on a test. Um, and so getting tested too soon after an exposure doesn't allow that time for the viral incubation period to even kind of get started. And so if you're testing at day seven after an exposure, that gives you enough time to allow that virus to replicate and to be able to identify identify people that have been um, infected after that exposure. Um, and so getting in too early is, um, would give people a false sense of confidence. Um, and keep in mind, you still need to wait those 14 days um, for quarantine because yeah, you potentially could get symptoms at day nine. So you shouldn't get tested and then go to the grocery store because those results could potentially be incorrect. You could get it at the grocery store. Uh, so I think that's important to notice. Um, Another thing I wanted to talk to you about is Halloween. I know Halloween is not for another month and a half, but um, LA County just announced yesterday that they are not condoning trick-or-treating anymore because of COVID-19 risks. 
what are your thoughts on how Utah can navigate Halloween? Typically, everyone is wearing a mask or some sort of face covering for Halloween, but is it safe for kids to go door to door with different family and friends or, or what should we really be doing for this Halloween? Yeah, well, to be honest, I haven't really thought much about Halloween yet. Um, it seems like that's kind of- I know it just got cold here. <laughs> and it snuck up on us a little bit. Um, so the good things about Halloween is it's outside and we're talking about general trick or treat. So um, you're outside, so that's a huge plus, right? Increased ventilation, less transmission, so that's great. Um, you're gonna need to wear a mask because most people don't trick or treat by themselves. Um, so absolutely 100% you need to use masks and you know, get creative, see if you can incorporate this into your costume. I'm sure there's plenty of people that are gonna get real creative in how they can use a mask and integrate in their costume. I think that'd be a great idea for you. Um, and then you have to you know, think about, well, what about people going up to a door talking to a stranger on multiple, you know, blocks in multiple houses, um, engaging with them, and then taking something from their house, sticking your hand into, you know, um, a, a pumpkin and bringing out um, like some candy. So there's lots of opportunities for viral transmission throughout all that. So I think, you know, if Utah is going to say we're, we're on for Halloween, um, I think what we'll have to be sh really kind of talking about and saying and supporting is Everyone's wearing a mask, absolutely. People at home that are answering the door for trick-or-treaters have to be wearing a mask. Um, and really good hand hygiene. And you know, maybe it's something where you put the candy out in a bowl and you allow people to go in and take it. Um, and maybe you even think about you know, how do you potentially disinfect you know, the candy wrappers and maybe put out candy that is easily cleanable. No apples, for example. Who wants an apple anyhow on Halloween, seriously? Um, but you know, be thinking about wearing a mask, how do you clean the candy? How do you minimize those interactions um, and definitely stay outside? I mean, those are things that um, I think would probably be you know, good core principles to think about as we kind of move into fall and think about Halloween. Could you also bring hand sanitizer with you too? So if you grab candy, you hand sanitize afterwards and then you clean it off when you get home. Could that be an option as well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think absolutely. Okay. Uh, I'm a big absolute proponent of washing your hands early and often. And so, um, you know, I don't think it's realistic to be washing your hands after every house that you go up to. Um, but I think, you know, definitely washing your hands uh, after opening, you know, candy, for example, before you eat the candy. And maybe you don't eat any candy while you're out trick or treating and you, you know, spray it down with some disinfectant before you, you know, handle the wrappers. I think all those things would be. Um, you know, pretty good and strong measures to avoid it. You brought up a point about the person, um, their household wearing a mask too. And I want to talk to you about some situations that have happened. If someone comes to your door, say a salesperson or UPS or anything like that, uh, and they want you to engage with them, if they don't have a mask on, what's the appropriate way to answer the door or tell someone, hey, you need to go over here. I don't feel comfortable. I had this situation happen to me actually a couple of days ago and I wasn't sure what to do, but they wouldn't leave without me answering the door. So yeah. any suggestions on how you handle that if someone comes to your house? Yeah, I mean, we've had people come to our home um, and I think one is to set a good example. So, you know, if you're going to answer that door, you have a mask on. And what that tells the person is, listen, I'm doing this for you. I'm, you know, you are a, a vital employee in terms of whether you're an Amazon delivery person, a mailman whatever it might be, you're an essential employee. Um, we need your help, whether at home or you're delivering our packages or mail or food, whatever it might be. And so um, show them the respect by wearing a mask. Um, and then I think, you know, you can politely ask like, hey, do you mind putting on a mask? Um, and if they're not, then, you know, they need to you know, maintain at least six feet of distance while you engage with them. Um, and, you know, I've had to do this at my home a number of times and everybody's been, you know, very you know, welcoming and said, oh yeah, absolutely, they'll put a mask on. So. I would just say, be nice, be respectful. These people are doing a job that is incredibly important for us. Um, but also at the same time, you know, I think you can ask them politely to put on a mask. Um, and I haven't had any issues with them with not doing it. And I think, you know, many of these um, kind of jobs, this is standard policy is to wear a mask. Um, and I think have an open conversation about it. And if you're uncomfortable, make sure that they stay six feet away. Good advice. Someone else just asked another question about Halloween candy. So I'm going to ask you that really quickly. They wanted to know if you think it would be helpful if you put Halloween candy in the freezer before giving it to someone. Um, I haven't heard anything about that, but 
Yeah, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, you know, I'm not sure if that's going to really impact a virus or not. Um, it might make for a nice cold Snickers bar. Um, but um, I mean, it definitely wouldn't hurt. I don't know if it's really going to help. And I think what the other research is showing is that the predominant form of transmission of this virus is through respiratory droplets. Um, that is the number one um, way that this virus transmit. There's probably <clears throat> a small amount of transmission through contact with inanimate objects in the environment, Halloween candy being one of them, for example. But the predominant form of transmission is through respiratory. So I would really focus more efforts on making sure your mask, making everybody else in your party mask, and making sure everybody that you go to their homes are masked as well. Making sure you're also not sick. So if you're sick around Halloween, I know that I typically get a cold in October. If you have any sort of symptoms, skip out on Halloween, maybe do your own trick-or-treating in your own house. That was brought up as, as a suggestion. Just go from like bedroom to bedroom and trick-or-treat that way with your family if you are sick and not able to go out. So good advice on that. And I mean, Halloween's still a month and a half away. So who knows what's going to happen in that next month and a half. Hopefully things get better. So Mm -hmm. last question for you it's a long ways away you know so i think yes. it's, we're going to learn about school going back into session and what this is going to happen and um the amount of kids that are positive and so i mean you can start making tentative plans but you know know that those plans will need to remain flexible and potentially have to change yep Last question for you about vaccines. I just want to give a quick update on vaccines. The last time we talked, um, we discussed the need for states to prepare for a potential November 1st vaccine being pushed. Do we have any updates on that? And also, will you talk to us a little bit about a clinical trial that was recently canceled as well or postponed? Yeah. So, um, you know, state health departments and healthcare networks like Intermountain, um, you know, got this mandate from. Um, from the federal government to say, hey, make sure you're prepared for vaccine distribution by November 1. You know, this is this vaccination distribution issue is something that, you know, we've been preparing for for a long time. We do vaccine distribution for influenza and other vaccines, HPV. Um, and so we've got teams working on this. And it's not because we were given a November 1 mandate. It was just because, you know, this is what we do and we need to prepare and we know that a coronavirus vaccine will be coming eventually and so it's it's something that we're preparing for um by no means and i want to be very clear about this by no means do i think that we're going to have a vaccine available by november 1st um you know the fda has already said we need at least six months of time to assess for serious safety events from the vaccine um, and most of these will likely need six months from this from the time that the trials um, fully enrolled. And so it's 30,000 people per trial. Um, it's going to take at least eight weeks, if not more, to enroll that many people. And so then you're talking six months from that. And so I'm hoping the earliest time that we'll see any kind of um, top level results from this is actually after the new year. So I'm thinking like February, March. And then the pharmaceutical company has to put together an application to the FDA to get emergency use authorization. So really, um, I'm really hoping the earliest would be quarter two of 2021. Um, and actually a group of eight pharmaceutical companies came together and wrote an open letter saying, we will not submit an application to the FDA until we have adequate safety data. Um, and so it really shows a pretty um, unique time where a group of pharmaceutical companies have come together and vowed to say, we need a minimum set of safety data before we can go forward and actually submit an application to the FDA, which I think is a very smart thing um, because it shows the commitment that the vaccine companies have to safety. And I think they're really smart about this because they know if they release their vaccine too early after it has not gone through appropriate safety testing, um, and then there's serious safety events due to the va that vaccine, that's gonna reflect very, very poorly on them and their company and their focus on safety. So. You know, this is obviously smart business for the vaccine makers as well. Um, and so I really don't think we're, we're going to have a vaccine ready for mass distribution until, you know, later in 2021. Intermountain will be ready. The University of Utah will be ready. Other healthcare networks are going to be ready to distribute this. And we'll have plans in terms of who's going to be prioritized for the vaccine in that initial phase. We're not going to have enough vaccine to vaccinate all 3.2 million people in Utah. And so we're going to have to be able to prioritize that in terms of um, who gets the vaccine. And partially that's going to be based on the, the study results, who has a benefit from the vaccine. 
you know, if we vaccinate older people that have comorbidities, but they don't have um, an appropriate response to the vaccine or they're not protected by the vaccine, they're not going to be first on the list. Um, and so it's really going to be dependent on what we see out of the study results. Now, you mentioned a vaccine study was halted um, yesterday, I believe, or two days ago. That was the Oxford, the AstraZeneca University of Oxford vaccine trial that's set in the UK. Um, and reported by the New York Times, there was a case of something called transverse myelitis um, that occurred in a vaccine recipient. Um, and so what happens then when you've got a big trial like this, and this is the way science should work, is that they take a pause. They say, we're gonna stop enrollment. We're gonna evaluate this case. We're gonna look at what potentially caused this. Are there alternative causes for this? Is this potentially due to the vaccine? Um, and so they're gonna take a pause and evaluate. And the evaluators are gonna go in and do a really in-depth analysis of this case to really try to figure out what happened and whether or not the vaccine could be um, you know, something that caused this or not. This is a sign of good science. Okay, this isn't a sign that this vaccine trial won't go on. This isn't a sign that the that vaccine is doomed. Um, this is just a sign of good science and thoughtful science that they're going to say, well, we got to pause. We have to evaluate this. And they may very well turn the trial back on, um, but they really need time to actually assess. And they don't want more people to be enrolling um, without having really fully assessed that one incident. And so um, I that's really great. I applaud those investigators about being vigilant about really assessing safety and we'll see what comes of it. Well, it's good to know that there's some sort of uh, system that they have in place in case something isn't going the way that it's supposed to be. So it's good to hear and it's good to hear that those pharmaceutical companies are taking a stand. It means that it's not all about money for them, which is nice. Uh, I know a lot of the times people can think that a company will wanna do something just for that, but it's good to hear that safety is a priority for them. So. Eddie, thank you so much for joining us this week. We really appreciate the update. And if you guys have any questions about COVID-19 and would like to get screened, you can still call our COVID-19 hotline at 844-442-5224. We also have our emotional health relief hotline available seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. That phone number is 833-442-2211. Thanks, Eddie. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Amanda.